Isaac Newton theorized, and it is now commonly taught and believed, that Earth's ocean tides are caused by gravitational lunar attraction. The moon's gravity allegedly generates something called tidal force, which causes Earth and its water to bulge out, not only on the side closest to the moon, but also the side farthest from the moon. Using their own calculations and predictions, however, if the moon is only 2,160 miles in diameter, and the Earth 8,000 miles, it follows that Earth is 87 times more massive, and therefore the larger object should attract the smaller to it, and not the other way around. Heliocentrists claim Earth's greater gravity is what keeps the moon in orbit. Therefore, it is impossible for the moon's far lesser gravity to supersede the Earth's gravity at Earth's sea level, where its gravitational attraction would even further out-trump the moon's. If the moon has enough gravitational influence to lift the ocean's water even a single inch from their deep recesses, where Earth's gravitational attraction is exponentially greater, then there is nothing in the theory of gravity to prevent the water from continuing its attraction all the way to the moon. Furthermore, the velocity and path of the moon are uniform, and thereby should exert a uniform influence on Earth's tides, when in actuality, the Earth's tides vary greatly. At Port Natal, for example, the rise and fall is only six feet, while at Biera, 600 miles up the coast, the rise and fall is 26 feet. Not only this, but if the moon's gravity was truly generating a tidal force causing Earth and its water to bulge out, then all the world's lakes, marshes, ponds, and other inland waters would be similarly affected and have tides as well. These and other problems caused Isaac Newton to openly admit that his explanation of the tides was the, quote, least satisfactory portion of his theory of gravitation. Dr. Samuel Robotham wrote, Thus we have been carried forward by the sheer force of evidence to the conclusion that the tides of the sea do not arise from the attraction of the moon, but simply from the rising and falling of the floating earth in the waters of the great deep. That calmness which is found to exist at the bottom of the great seas could not be possible if the waters were alternately raised by the moon and pulled down by the earth. Bearing this fact in mind, that there exists a continual pressure of the atmosphere upon the earth, and associating it with the fact that the earth is a vast plain stretched out upon the waters, and it will be seen that it must of necessity slightly fluctuate, or slowly rise and fall in the water as by the action of the atmosphere, the earth is slowly depressed. The water moves towards the receding shore and produces the flood tide. And when by the reaction of the resisting oceanic medium, the earth gradually ascends, the waters recede, and the ebb tide is produced. This is the general cause of tides. Whatever peculiarities are observable, they may be traced to the reaction of channels, bays, headlands, and other local causes. David Wardlaw Scott wrote, Tides vary greatly in height, owing chiefly to the different configurations of the adjoining lands. At Chepstow, it rises to 60 feet, at Portishead to 50, while at Dublin Bay it is but 12, and at Wexford only 5 feet. That the earth itself has a slight tremulous motion may be seen in the movement of the spirit level, even when fixed as steadily as possible, and that the sea has a fluctuation may be witnessed by the oscillation of an anchored ship in the calmest day of summer. By what means the tides are so regularly affected is at present only conjectured. Possibly it may be by atmospheric pressure on the waters of the great deep, and perhaps even the moon itself, as suggested by the late Dr. Robotham, may influence the atmosphere, increasing or diminishing its barometric pressure, and indirectly the rise and fall of the earth in the waters. The tides are clearly a product of the interconnected ocean waters, and not the other waters of earth, and therefore caused either by a natural fluctuation of the earth resting upon the great deep, as stated by the above and other 19th century authors, or, if more ancient explorers' accounts can be trusted, an even more fascinating possibility presents itself. Many cultures throughout history have recorded that located at the North Pole, exists a large lodestone mountain surrounded by a massive whirlpool vortex which was claimed to cause the Earth's tides. 
This maelstrom allegedly reverses direction every six hours, alternately pulling in and pushing out the ocean waters, like the breath of Gaia at the naval center point of Earth, breathing in and out twice per day. If true, this explains the consistent regularity of high and low tides better than any other proposed theory. Ancient Norse legends state that a gigantic violent whirlpool known as Virgilmir, or the World's Well, surrounds the polar mountain and via four six-hour daily cycles of pushing and pulling through subterranean channels causes the rising and falling tides of Earth. Historical records of this deep abyss can be found as early as the 8th century AD, when Paulus Diaconus, or Paul the Deacon, wrote in his Historia Langobardorum that, quote, not far from the shore, where the ocean extends without bounds, is that very deep abyss of waters which we commonly call the ocean's navel. It is said twice a day to suck the waves into itself and to spew them out again, as is proved to happen along all these coasts, where the waves rush in and go back again with fearful rapidity. By the whirlpool of which we have spoken, it is asserted that ships are often drawn in with such rapidity that they seem to resemble the flight of arrows through the air, and sometimes they are lost in the gulf with a very frightful destruction. Often, just as they are about to go under, they are brought back again by a sudden shock of the waves, and they are sent out again, thence with the same rapidity with which they were drawn in. In 1035 AD, Phrygian explorer Adam of Bremen recounted his deadly encounter with this abysmal chasm in his book Gesta Hemerbergensis Ecclesiastae Pontificum, stating, quote, Of a sudden, they fell into that numbing ocean's dark mist, which could hardly be penetrated with the eyes. And behold, the current of the fluctuating ocean whirled back to its mysterious fountainhead, and with most furious impetuosity drew the unhappy sailors, who in their despair now thought only of death, on to chaos. This, they say, is the abysmal chasm, that deep in which report has it that all the backflow of the sea, which appears to decrease, is absorbed and in turn re-vomited, as the mounting fluctuation is usually described. As the partners were imploring the mercy of God to receive their souls, the backward thrust of the sea carried away some of their ships, but its forward ejection threw the rest far behind the others. Freed thus by the timely help of God from the instant peril they had had before their eyes, they seconded the flood by rowing with all their might. Geraldus Cambrensis, or Gerald of Wales, Archdeacon of Brecon, and Royal Clerk to King Henry II, wrote in his 1188 work, Topographia Hibernica, that, quote, Not far from the islands towards the north, there is an astonishing whirlpool in the sea, towards which there is a set current of the waves from all quarters, until, pouring themselves into nature's secret recesses, they are swallowed up, as it were, in the abyss. Should a vessel chance to pass in that direction, it is caught and drawn along by the force of the waves, and sucked by the vortex without chance of escape. There are four of these whirlpools in the ocean, described by philosophers as existing in the four different quarters of the world, whence it has been conjectured that the currents of the sea, as well as the winds, are regulated by fixed principles. The whirlpool was also mentioned in another late 12th century work, Historia Norwegia, where the author, an anonymous Norwegian monk, gives a particularly detailed description, stating, quote, The greatest of all whirlpools is to be found there, which engulfs the strongest ships, sucking them in at ebb tide and spewing out their fragments with a belch at flood tide. There is a very deep abyss in the earth itself, and alongside it are open-mouthed caverns containing winds which are said to be brought forth by the breathing of the water, and these are the breath of gales. Indeed, by their breathing, these winds draw to them the waters of the sea through hidden passages in the earth. They shut them up in the vaults of the abyss, and then, by the same force, drive them out again, causing sea surges, spates, and the whirling of water spouts. Earthquakes also occur, and various discharges of vapor and conflagration. For when the wind's breath, held in the cheeks of earth, presses to burst out, it shakes the foundation of the world with a dreadful roaring, 
and forces it to tremble. So when the wind's breath contends with fire in the earth's interior, then even in mid-ocean the depths are fissured and smoky exhalations and sulfurous flames are seen to emerge. In 1508, cartographer Johannes Ruisch published a world map featuring the polar mountain and whirlpool with an inscription reading, Under the Arctic Pole, there is a high magnetic rock, 33 German miles in circumference. A surging sea surrounds this rock, as if the water were discharged downward from a vase through an opening to four mouths below. Later, in 1595, the most well-known mapmaker in history, Gerardus Mercator, published his Septentrionalium Terrarum Descriptio, featuring the polar mountain and encircling whirlpool in detail, along with the following inscription, quote, A monstrous gulf in the sea, towards which from all sides the billows of the sea coming from remote parts converge and run together, as though brought there by conduit, pouring into these mysterious abysses of nature, they are as though devoured thereby, and, should it happen that a vessel pass there, it is seized and drawn away with such powerful violence of the waves that this hungry force immediately swallows it up, never to appear again. A surviving letter from Mercator, addressed to John D., advisor to Queen Elizabeth I, provides more detail, stating, quote, In the midst of the four countries is a whirlpool, into which there empty these four indrawing seas, which divide the north. And the water rushes round and descends into the earth, just as if one were pouring it through a filter funnel. It is four degrees wide on every side of the pole, that is to say, eight degrees altogether. As late as the mid-seventeenth century, the polar mountain and encircling whirlpool continued appearing in cartography and cosmography. They were included in Linschoten's 1595 map, the Ortelius of 1599, Quad's Facivilis Geographicus of 1608, Hondius's 1619 map, Purchase's map of 1625, and in Halen's 1659 cosmography, he wrote about them, stating that, quote, Under the Arctic Pole is said to be a black rock of wondrous height, about 33 leagues in compass, the land adjoining being torn by the sea into four great islands, for the ocean violently breaking through it and disgorging itself by nineteen channels maketh four Euripi, or fierce whirlpools, by which the waters are finally carried towards the north, and these swallowed into the bowels of the earth. That Euripus, or whirlpool, which is made by the Scythic ocean, hath five inlets, and by reason of his straight passage and violent course is never frozen. The other on the back of Greenland, being thirty-seven leagues long, hath three inlets, and remaineth frozen three months yearly. A certain scholar of Oxford reporteth that these four Europe are carried with such furious violence towards some gulf, in which they are finally swallowed up, that no ship is able, with never so strong a gale, to stem the current, and yet there is never so strong a wind as to blow a windmill. So in summation, the prevailing modern explanation of Earth's tides being caused by the moon's gravity is provably incorrect for several reasons, including its insufficient attractive power, the tide's non-uniformity, and the lack of tides on all inland bodies of water. Their true cause could be, as Samuel Robotham proposed, the natural gentle fluctuation of earth on the waters of the great deep. However, this simple explanation alone fails to provide an answer for the perfect regularity of tides rising and falling every six hours. To account for this, ancient explorers and cartographers offer the much more fascinating possibility of a world well beneath the pole pushing and pulling all the ocean waters of the earth through massive subterranean caverns. There is modern circumstantial evidence that lends strong credence to this idea as well. The largest publicly known maelstrom in the world is called Saltstrumen, just north of the Arctic Circle in Norway, where 400 million cubic meters of water pass through a 3-kilometer long, 150-meter wide strait, reaching speeds of 10 meters per second. Similar to legends of Virgilmir, this northern whirlpool actually arises exactly four times per day, every six hours, along with the shifting tides. In fact, the majority of naturally occurring whirlpools in the world 
including the famous Naruto whirlpools in Japan, form four times per day, every six hours, as the tides change. If the ancient legends are true, this also potentially explains why strict flying and sailing restrictions exist at the North Pole, and why explorers like Rodney Clough were turned away at gunpoint by Russian military vessels when attempting to independently explore the North Polar region. Nowadays, the world well has all but disappeared from modern maps and mines, but with the current rising tide of truth, there are sure to come more revealing revelations. <laughs>